Okay, thank you, Rabbi Jay. So today I think is class number 20. And today uh, we're going to almost finish up Nehemia because next week when we finish up the course, we want to relate it to modern day times. We have to get to Lord Balfour. We'll, we'll skip a couple thousand years. Uh, so today I'm going to share my um, the source sheet in a minute. There's a map. I'm going to share one file for the map. You can have that in the chat. And the source sheet, for those who didn't get the first link, is going to be this one. And now, here. And now I can share my source sheet and we'll get to work. There we go. So uh, I'll explain the title. Is the Holy Land holy during the time of Ezra Nehemiah? So there's a whole concept of Tusha that we have to talk about. But in order to understand the title, we have to do a quick review and get started again because it's been three weeks since we were in Nehemia. So where are we going to where we left off uh, in our study? It was year 20 of our Tachshasta. Remember Ezra made Aliyah in year seven, tried to uh, start teaching Torah and get rid of uh, intermarriage. We saw in light of what happened in year 20, he was relatively not that successful. When Nehemia came in year 20 of our Tachshasta, first he begins with uh, getting the people motivated to work on the wall and the city walls are reconstructed. He gets a little bit of nationalism in there and pride. And after they finish the wall, they gather in Rosh Hashanah to have a little celebration. Now they have a, a walled city. They go to the Beit HaMikdash, which was already built from way back, but also not in the greatest shape. Uh, they have a gathering. The people are sad. Tells them, don't be sad. Uh, you know, enjoy Yantav. They come back and they build, uh, they study about building Sukkot. There's a national circus building. We talked about it in our last year that they use the circus building to, as a sort of a uh, impetus to introduce Torah study. And there's mass Torah instruction, people teaching laws, people hadn't learned in a long time. And now after the circus gathering, a week later, there's a special post circus gathering and they make this big treaty. And we were in the middle of that treaty when we left off two weeks ago, we're gonna to return to it. Now we went through most of it. I wanna just review it from the beginning again to point out why we say this in davening. We quote this in after Vayvarech David, we quote from Vayvarech David when David is get, giving the building materials for the first base to make this shishlomo and gives a benediction to the people and blesses them as he gives over the building materials to shlomo to build the first base of mikdash in the middle of ivarach david we switch from the beginning of the first temple to the beginning of the second temple to the time of nehemia uh, i want to point out when we go through there that the history that he's going over is going to be key for understanding what's going to happen in today's year so we're going to start in chapter 10. We're going to review what we did a couple of weeks ago uh, in the background. And we're going to see that in chapter 10, after there's a review of biblical history, and they make this covenant to become, um, not to sort of reconfirm becoming God's people. The covenant was still existing, but they want to reaffirm it because they hadn't been keeping it too well. And they're going to confirm the Torah laws and Edward Binnacles. So I have to go through the speech one more time and try to understand why specifically this history is the background to reconfirming Torah laws and adding rabbinic clause. And that'll help us understand um, what's, about the, what's special about the Holy Land in the Second Temple period. And this will have a big effect on Israel today, and it'll lead us into what we're going to talk about next week. What's the status of the land of Israel as far as Kedusha, as far as holiness is concerned? Oh, so we're back, sorry. I think, in the end of chapter 9. Uh, let me just get the... Uh, do a quick little... Mute and we'll get started. Okay, we're all muted. And anybody has questions, you can put in the chat or or you can raise your hand. Okay. So we're back, I think, in chapter nine. Uh, the Levim, they all stand on the uh, Yeshua and the whole bunch of Levim stand on the Duchen and the Vaisakuba Kol Gadol Hashem. They call it with a great cry to God. That's where we left off. And what do they do? They say, Baruch They tell the people, bless God, like we do in davening, and they answer. Now, in this speech, what do they say? You're the only God. You made the Shemayim Ba'aretz. Now, what I want you to follow is how in this speech, he's going to follow biblical history. The first uh, line in Pasuk Vav in verse 6 is basically the story of creation in Breshit. That's basically the story of creation and I think we say in davening. 
And then we go from creation right to God choosing Avram Avinu. But listen specifically what he talks about. Atahu Hashem Elohim, you're Hashem, the God. Asher brachart Avram, v'otzeitu mor kasdim v'sam tashmo Avraham. So what we mentioned, I think, last time is that this Pasuk is referring to two covenants. You're the God who took Avram out of Or Kazdim, that's Brit Ben of Tarim, as we'll see today, and changed his name to Avraham, that was Brit Milah. From here on, though, almost the entire focus is going to be on Brit Ben of Tarim, and that's going to be key for our share. Let me give you the main point of the introduction, and then we'll get to work. We're going to see in today's share that there are sort of conflicting borders of the land of Israel. God promises Avram Avinu, the land of Israel, in two covenants. In Brit Ben of Tarim, the covenant of the parts, and there we're going to see a very uh, large definition, a very wide bo- uh, definition of the borders of Israel. And then in Brit Milah, who's going to promise him what we call Eretz Canaan, which will be much smaller. We have to explain the reason for it and how it's going to affect what's happening in the time of Nehemiah. We'll return to all this in a minute. I just want to point out, as we go through these psukim one, one last time that we're familiar with from davening, I want you, to, I want to point out how many things are here from Brit Ben of Tarim. We're going to read Brit Ben Tarim in a minute. But just pay attention, and, and we're going to see it again back in Chumash. Okay. That is clearly, we'll see in a minute. If you remember that. And then is word for word from Bipen of Tarim. In fact, let's just go down a little bit. I want to show you what I'm talking about. If I go here to Bipen of Tarim, what does God tell Avram Avinu? Um, God begins after the first section, after he means God tells Avram, Ani Hashem, Asher Teticha Mi Or Kazdim, I took you out of Or Kazdim, to give you the slam, the Rishta, to inherit. And then Avram asks the question, how do I know I can inherit it? And he goes on with the promise. And at the end of that uh, discussion with Avram, you know, on that day, Bayamahu Karat Hashem at Avram Brit Lemor, the Zarchan Natat Eta Arsazot, Bin Hamid Saman Hargadon Har Prat, God convened the covenant. See this brit karat Hashem at Avram brit from, from this Nile River to the Euphrates River. We're going to return to those borders very soon. Let's go back now to Nehemiah. And I simply want to make point that out because that's what we say every day in davening in, um, in Pesuki de Zimra. Okay. In fact, we put a little break here. We stop in the middle. Sometimes the chazan stops here. The original minute was at a Brit Milah where you would do that. But I think to this day, we stop here and we start again. And we say, we'll see. we'll see this is the land of the borders of the seven nations to give to his offspring. And you kept your, and you kept your promise. Now, it's important that Nehemiah is, telling, is saying here in his praise of God in the history that you kept your promise. You found that Avram, was trustworthy, you made a covenant with him, and you kept your promise. Now, what else did God promise in Brit Ben of Tarim, in the covenant of the parts, that we would go through enslavement in Egypt and then redemption from Egypt? So then we say, you saw our suffering in Egypt, and we cried out to you, and you did all these miracles coming out of Egypt, and you did Kriyat Yamsuf, everything we say in davening, and then you can, and we end davening over here. Uh, remember? Vayam Bakarthi and then we go to Parsha B'Shalach. We go from Nehemiah right here. We go to Parsha B'Shalach. Now, then Nehemiah continues in the speech. We're going to skip most of it. He continues all the events in Parsha B'Shalach. And then Parsha Itro and Har Sinai give us laws. But we didn't listen. And even though we didn't listen, God had uh, mercy. And we talk about Chet Egel, And God had mercy on us. He goes on and on, and basically 40 years we were in the desert, he took care of us in the desert. Now, Pasach Abed, verse 22. After God takes care of us in the desert and brings us into Israel, pay attention to the word Yerusha. We saw that in Brit Ben of Tarim. We're going to make a big deal about it here again. But you gave them other kingdoms, other nations. But Yeshu et Eretz Sichon. They inherited or conquered the land of Sichon, the land of Cheshbon, and the land of Og Melech HaBashan. Look at all the references here to the same covenant of the parts. Like the stars of heaven. That's right out, out of Brit Ben of Tarim and Gata Zabram. Look at the stars. That's how many children you're going to have. 
and to again to conquer. We'll see in a minute why I'm making such a big deal about the word Lareshet. Yerusha does not mean just to inherit, it means to possess through it through basically through military conquest. So the next generation came and possessed the land and conquered it. And God helped them defeat all the Canaanites. And we took over their kings. Now, verse 25, quoting left and right from Sefer Devarim, the most speech in the 40th year, what's going to happen when we conquer the land of Israel. So that takes us into the time period of Yeshua where we fulfill the first stage of Brit Ben Tarim, we conquer the land. And the reason why this is going to be important, we'll see soon, the big difference between the first temple period and the second temple period is in the first temple period, we conquered the land and we were sovereign. In the second temple period, as we've mentioned many times, we returned to the land of Israel, but we are not sovereign. That difference between being in the land of Israel with our own sovereignty, as opposed to being in the land of Israel without being sovereign under uh, other foreign sovereignty, that's going to make a big difference in how we view the mitzvot, the commandments that we keep in the land of Israel. So I just want to finish the speech again. Um, he's going to talk about what happened during the first temple period. We rebelled against God in the time of the Shoftim, in the time of the judges, and later during um, the first temple. And we didn't listen to the prophets, etc. And nonetheless, even though we didn't deserve it, because of your mercy, you didn't wipe us out. Why? Because ki al chanu brachumata. Verse 32, lamed bet. Vatel lahinu ela gadol hagibor banorah shomer brit bachesed. Again, you God, you're great. You're merciful, uh, but you keep your covenant. Okay. Please take into consideration all the suffering that we've gone through, our kings and our officers and our priests and our prophets, right? From the time we, from the time of our, from the time of the kings of Ashur, basically, from the time that the first temple was destroyed till now, look how much we've suffered. Now remember, we suffered terribly in Egypt, and God redeemed us and gave us the land of Israel, and we possessed it. We mistreated, or we sort of broke our covenant, and God had to send us into exile. But we suffered through that exile, and now we're returning, and Nehemi, in his speech, wants to make sure that, in his prayer, wants God to take that into consideration. Now listen carefully. We didn't keep our laws. And with their kingdom, Malchutam is their kingdom, that means their sovereignty. You gave us sovereignty and we mistreated it. And this beautiful, great land you gave us, we didn't keep your laws properly. And now that was first temple period. Now we return with a whole new reality. Now we are not slaves, but we're under foreign rule. We're servants to the Persian authorities. This is going to be the background to the affirmation of the covenant he's going to make and the new mitzvot that they're going to take upon themselves. It says again, now we're no longer sovereign in the land. We'll see in a minute. Our produce, even though we're working the land, we have to pay taxes to the kings that you put on top of us because of our sins. Nechem is recognizing we're under foreign rule because of our sins. We're not deserving of sovereignty. You took that away from us. We've returned under Persian rule. And because of our sins, it's not your fault. It's our fault that we're under foreign rule. And, and they can do whatever they want, again, on us, on our cattle, and on our produce. And we're in bad shape. And now listen carefully. Here's where we left off. Despite all this, we're entering a covenant. What's that basically mean? Now we're in chapter 10 in Nehemiah. Even though we're under foreign rule and we're not sovereign in our land, we're going to take upon ourselves some obligations. And then we have a list of the people who signed and we're going to skip that whole list. But it includes all the people, the priests, the Levites, um, the, the choir, everyone. Everyone who separated themselves from the foreign people to keep God's laws. Remember, this was after uh, the whole circus study time period. Now, the whole month of Tishrei was full of Torah study. 
and celebrating holidays. Now it's the end of the month of Tishrei. Circus is over. We have this final gathering and they're going to take upon themselves to keep mitzvot. Now listen what he tells us. We're entering a, a oath. We're going to follow God's instructions, the Torah. The Torah that was given to us through Moshe Rabbeinu, the servants of God, we're going to keep. Number one, we're going to take all the laws of the Torah and keep them. Now that should include everything, right? Now he's going to add something. Rabbi Jake maybe can give you a share on this later on, but if you read the Torah carefully, I'm pretty sure it never says anywhere you can't marry a non-Jew. It says you can't marry the seven nations when you take it over. But um, you, it would be easy to infer from there. It's logical to say you can't do it to marry. But the, it doesn't, I'm pretty sure it doesn't say explicitly you can't marry a non-Jew. Of course, it's obviously that's the halacha and that's the logical conclusion. But they want to emphasize that you can't, we can't give our daughters to the local population, nor can we give our sons to marry their daughters. Um, so again, they're going to affirm again, and you see the problem of intermarriage at the time. Now, now we're going to see another problem that's happening. There is massive desecration of the Sabbath. The businesses are running, stores are open on Shabbat. So we're going to take upon ourselves to keep Shabbat properly. The local people who are bringing things to sell and food on Shabbos to sell, we're not going to go to the marketplace on Shabbat anymore. And we're going to keep Shemitah every seven years. We're going to be more makpi now on Shabbat. We're going to close the marketplaces and we're going to keep Shemitah now. This was all building up to Pasuk Lamed Gimel. mitzvot, meaning what? We took upon ourselves mitzvot in addition to what's called the Araita, in addition to these biblical obligations, we're going to take upon ourselves additional mitzvot to add a third of a shekel to the, for the temple treasury. We just, in fact, this week's parsha is Maksita shekel. Most commentators hold that they needed more money to run the temple because it's a smaller population and you still have the temple to run. And therefore, in addition to the machsita shekel, they added another third of a shekel, an extra tax, for all the different things they need for the Beit HaMikdash. And also they made a decision to donate wood for the Mizbech. That's Pasuk Lamed Now, as we're talking about the mitzvot that we've added on, Pasuk Lamed Vav, in addition to the biblical laws, we're going to take upon ourselves to bring our first fruits of the land every year to God's house. What's the problem? The problem is, Bikurim is there is in the Torah. Why are we take it upon ourselves, Drabanan? Why is the Cheminel saying we're going to take all the Torah laws? In addition to that, we're going to add some new obligations to bring Bikurim, to bring our first fruits. That's the law in the Bible. And also the Bukhor, the firstborn animals of our children as well, when we have to do Pidon Aben, and of our cattle. And also Trumot, what we call the tithes. Remember this Truma that you give a little bit to the Kohen and then you give 10% to the Levim from all the, um, all the fruit of the land. We have to give to the Kohanim. And the Master, we have to give to the Bim. One tenth goes to the Levites. And then the Levites have to give 10% of what we get. They give to the Kohen. And then they talk about um, they're going to give all the Master. We won't go into the details here, but in general, we're supposed to give 10% to the Levites. And the Levites give 10% of what we gave them, which ends up being 1% to the Kohanim. But they're going to do that all together to make sure the Kohanim get what they deserve from the Bim. There's a bit of a problem when they were proportioning out the, the Trumoto Masor at the time. But they take upon themselves to give Trumoto Masor properly. And then we'll see it later on, they're gonna also um, get volunteers to move to move to Yerushalayim. Now, we have to focus our share now on what's the reason why Bikurim is Drabanan? Why is it the bringing Bikurim in the time of Nehemiah, even though it's a Torah law, why is it 
that we add this in addition to the Torah laws, even though it is a Torah law. So let me stop here. We're going to stop the share for a second and take a look at the chat real fast because I saw a couple questions. We'll take a quick break. Um, okay, we'll talk about the conquest in a minute. Okay, only seven nations. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, okay. Um, no, in, in, in the, about the verse to marry says, when you come to land and say for Devarim, don't marry off your children, but it could be understood in Sefer Devarim that's talking about um, the seven nations. It says explicitly in the Torah, it's only the seven nations. Right, it I'm, says explicitly, right? Yeah. yeah, only the seven nations. The extension is to everybody else. I know this is in the Ripley's, believe it or not, but there are certain Rishonim, I believe, who believe who claim that intermarriage with non-Jews is only Mid Rabbanan on a technical level. On a sociological level, it's very bad, but the uh, Torah that does not actually prohibit intermarriage with non-Jew, but that's beyond this. I'm sorry, but since you were asking and they mentioned that. No, I think I think I think God as if in wisdom knows that if it's a Drabanan will be more makbid on it than if it's a Diraisa. <laughs> I mean, most assume it's the right there, but there are Rishonim, maybe in the Tori, but I have to, have to look it up now. I don't remember all the details, but there, there is a discussion on a technical halachic basis. What's the prohibition? On a sociological basis, there's no discussion. It's quite obvious. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's obvious the Torah doesn't want us to intermarry. It's, logic, it's a logical conclusion. It's why it's only mentioned explicitly by the seven nations could be that was the immediate problem in the time of Sefer Devarim. Um, I, I was saying in jest before, hope you got my joke. Is that if it's a Rabbanan, there's more chance that Amisra will keep the law if it's a rabbinic law more than if it's a Diorita. Like, uh, like, we got that, that was supposed to be said in jest. Okay, now let's get back. Um, um, Judy asked one other question, which we'll deal with next week. How come um, all these texts we're learning in Ezra and Nehemiah, how come no one's aware of it? It's not in your classic, it's not part of our classic Jewish education. That's exactly why we're doing this class. I think it should be, but. Actually, we're going to discuss probably a good reason next week why they don't teach it. Okay, so that's it for the chat. Now we're going to get to work. Now we have, that was the boring part. Now we get to the fun part. I'm going to show you something which is rather amazing. Based on what we just read, we're going to learn the Rambam because the Rambam has this what's called Mishneh Torah. He has halachot, you know, all the halachot you need. And there's numerous laws that relate to the land of Israel and what's called tithing. There's laws that's called mitzvot at blood ba'aretz. Laws that relate to what we do in the land of Israel. And we need to define what is the land of Israel in order to be obligated to give our tithes. So what defines the land of Israel? Now ask any, you can do this for fun of it one time. Show someone a map of the Middle East and ask him where is Israel. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to share my screen. I'm going to open up a, going to go into space. Okay. Everyone notice the satellite map? I hope you can figure it out here. Let me get my annotate here. Get my little spotlight. Okay, this is the Mediterranean Sea, this blue. This is the Red Sea. Um, this is the Gulf of Suez. Suez Canal goes that way. This is the Gulf of Aqaba. There's a lot. Uh, this is the Nile River. We'll point out later on, Nile River. This is the Nile Delta. It, this is like basically Egypt is over here. This is the uh, Persian Gulf over here. This is Euphrates River over here. And if you let me make this a little bit bigger now. Um, here we go. I will focus it a little better now. In the land of Israel, this is the Dead Sea. Uh, this is the, uh, this all from a satellite map, I think from, I forgot what's that, what um, shuttle mission was on, but one of the shuttles took a picture of this picture here. And notice the green in the Nile Delta in Egypt. That's a result of the river, of the Nile River flowing from Southern Egypt, from Ethiopia, past Aswan Dam and basically flooding, not flooding, but watering the Nile Delta. And that's what makes Egypt such a superpower. And then um, this is basically the area of Lebanon, the green part of, over here, and this is Syria. And if you want to understand what's so special about the land of Israel, we get a lot, we get a lot more rain than anywhere else in the Middle East for good reason, because the rain comes in from the clouds. And when the, um, I mean, the clouds absorb the water, the evaporation from the sea. And when the clouds come inland, when the temperature is right, when it's cold enough, uh, we get rain. And the rain, basically, the clouds give off the rain, the first 30, 40, 50, 60 kilometers, and, and pretty much stops. 
And that's why Israel has so much rain and so much greener than the rest of the Middle East. So even though we're a small country, our land is very, very good. And that's the land that God gave us. Now, um, so here's the map we're all familiar with. If you ask someone on the map, what are the borders of Israel? What are the borders of Israel? What would they tell you? Now, there'll be, everyone agrees on the uh, Western border, right? Yeah, um, where the mar marker is. The Mediterranean Sea is a Western border. One last little joke. Uh, our argument with the with our enemies is, is the Mediterranean Eastern border or Western border? But everyone agrees it's a border. But now seriously, um, the Mediterranean is our Western border. And what's our Southern border? So if you come to Israel nowadays, it's a lot down over here. But was this part of the land of Israel? I'll prove to you it can be because in our 40 years in the desert, most of the time we're in the Negev. And Moshe Rabbeinu's last year is like, you know, is in the Negev all the time. Horahar is down here, down, you know, either in the Sinai or the Negev. But it doesn't make sense that the Negev, that's it, the Negev of Israel State would be part of Israel because like, we're in Midbar Tzin, according to Chazal, at least 19 years, maybe even longer. And that's a little south of the Dead Sea, in the Negev. Clearly, the other side of the Jordan is not part of Israel because Moshe is there in the 40th year and he can't go into the land. Um, so the southern border isn't so clear, but we'll see in a minute. Um, we'll see soon the border, the southern border is going to be pretty much the, from the tip of the Dead Sea down towards the El Arish. Right? Basically, this the um, what we call days like the edge of the northern edge of the Sinai Peninsula and the Negev. What's our northern border? But well, we know Lebanon's not part of Israel, but we know the Kinneret is. So somewhere appears our northern border. And what's our eastern border? That's a big question. So in general, there's two sets of borders we're all familiar with. There's what's called from the now to the Euphrates, and there's what's called from Dan to Beersheba. I'll start with Dan to Beersheba. From Dan to Beersheba is basically, Beersheba is opposite the bottom of the Dead Sea. So where uh, my little markers, that's pretty much the southern border of Israel, because anything south of that, there's not enough water or rain to inhabit in a normal way. So naturally, it would make sense the border of Israel would end where no one could no longer, where people can't inhabit it anymore. The northern border, we know Dan is a northern border. Dan is up a little north of the Kinneret in the Cholo Valley. But we know that Lebanon is not part of Israel. So somewhere up here is the northern border. And the Jordan River is our eastern border. So we're going to see this in another map in a minute. That's called Dante Beersheba, or the borders of Eretz Canaan. But where are the borders of Brit Ben Abterim that we were talking about? I'll show you on a different map now. Let me move this to this one here. I've highlighted here the Nile River. This is the Euphrates River, Nahar Prat, over here. And if the borders of Israel, or what it sounds like in Brit Ben Abterim, from the Nile to the Euphrates, then the land of Israel is half, over half the Middle East. And there is one Navi, or any time in the Bible where God tells us, how come you're not conquering all this land? That would be all of Iraq, all of Syria, um, most of Saudi Arabia, or part of Saudi Arabia, all of Jordan, half of Egypt, you know, the, from the eastern bank of the Nile, all the Sinai. Yeshua never captures that, and we're never commanded to capture that. But how could it be that our borders are from Nahar Mitzrayim to Nahar Prat? We're going to try and tackle that question today. Because those don't seem like borders. We're going to see those are going to be limits of a border. Um, we're going to return to that topic in a minute. But what I, what I want to show you from the satellite map, if I look at the borders from the Nile to the Euphrates, that's massive in half the Middle East. If I look from Dante Beersheba, it's just this little area over here that I have in yellow, very small area, which is maybe probably 5% of that big area, even less. So this understanding the borders is going to be key understanding the Rambam coming up. So that's the map. We're going to return to the map in a minute. Now we're going to go to the Rambam and we're going to see how the Rambam defines uh, the land of Israel. Okay. Um, I apologize for not having an English translation of this. I just had it in Hebrew, nice and uh, formatted. So I'll translate it. I'll read it and do it slowly. It's the book of uh, Rambam, the laws of Trumot, in the Sefer, what's called Sefer Zeraim. One of the 14 books is called, I guess, Seeds or Zeraim, but it's laws about things relating to the land. 
And the third book is called Hechot Trumot, The Laws of Giving Tithing. Now, before the Rambam talks about how much tithe to give, he has to define what's the land of Israel. This is what he says. Halacha Aleph. Tithing, what we call mitzvot atlod ba'aretz, the laws that apply to the land of Israel, only, or the obligation is only in the land of Israel, Eretz Israel, whether the temple is built or not. Meaning, I don't need a temple in order to be obligated to bring trumot to Masarot, but I do need, um, but I have to be in the land. We'll see in a minute. What, what's needed. Now he has to define what is the land of Israel. You would expect now a geographic definition. I expect to get borders. Instead, he's going to give a political definition. And this is the key point I want to clarify. Listen carefully. Now, when he says it doesn't mean everywhere in the Torah because it rarely says Eretz Yisrael in the Torah. Rather, everywhere in his work, in, in the Rambam, in his book of Jewish law, the Mishneh Torah, whenever he talks about Eretz Yisrael, especially in Hilchot, in Sefer Zeraim, relating to Trumot and Masrot, relating to tithing, whenever he says the land of Israel where we're obligated, what's that referring to? He shukovesh otam melech Yisrael. That's in the land that's conquered by the king of Israel. Now you understand why I made such a big deal about sovereignty. The Rambam is going to give a political definition of the land of Israel. And he's going to say that the land of Israel, as far as tithing is concerned, as far as Trumot and Masrot, as far as those laws are concerned, our obligation only begins if we're sovereign in the land. And in order to have the halachic status of the land of Israel, of Eretz Israel, what's required? We need conquest. Kovesh means to conquer. It has to be land conquered not by a Jew, but rather the king of the Jews. He'll explain in a minute. If an individual Jew conquers the land of Israel, that's not good. The people of Israel have to conquer the land. And therefore, it can be by a king. It doesn't have to be a dynasty. It doesn't have to be someone you know, who's a king with a robe. But rather, it has to be a political leader. He could be a judge. He could be a prophet. As long as it's done by the majority of the people of Israel. Am Yisrael is a nation. It could be a shofet. You know, it could have been one of the shoftim. Or it could be a king. Or even a navi. But as long as it's conquered with the understanding and with the agreement as, as a, as a uh, I guess, an action of the entire Jewish people or the majority of the Jewish people, that's what defines the land. From now on, he's going to refer to this as the conquest of the many. Meaning the nation of Israel conquers the land. Now, we're going to have a problem now what defines the people of Israel? He's going to give a, a, a rather technical definition now. He's going to distinguish between kibush rabim, joint conquests as a people, as opposed to individuals. Avo yachid a single person. O mishpacha o shevet, or even a tribe or a family. Let's say the Rashal family conquers the land. Or a tribe, tribe of, let's say the tribe of um, Ephraim conquers the whole land. Shochuva kavshul atzman makom, an individual, not the people of Israel, but rather a small group, an individual group of Israel. Even, they could all be Jewish, they could all be from the same shevet, from the same tribe. If it's not done as the people of Israel, even if they conquer it and they're sovereign, and even if they conquer, listen, afilu not Abraham, even the land that was promised to Avram Avinu. Now we'll see what land was promised to Avram. He's referring here to Eretz Canaan in a minute. That does not have the halachic definition of Eretz Yisrael. It might, we can call it the land of Israel. We call it the land of Canaan. It might have um, intrinsic holiness and things like that. But from a halachic point of view, as far as the laws relating to tithing, to Trumot and Masrot, in order to be obligated to keep the mitzvot, it's not considered Eretz Yisrael unless we're, unless we're sovereign and sovereignty of the people of Israel. And therefore, what did Yeshua do? Because Yeshua did not finish the conquest, someone mentioned that before in the chat, because Yeshua did not finish the conquest, what did Yeshua have to do? Um, Yeshua divided it up to, among the tribes before they conquered it, before they finished the conquest, even though it wasn't conquered. 
so that when the conquest would finish, would be, uh, that's all from Yeshua Perak Yotchet, where he yells at the seven tribes who didn't finish their job. He says, we're sending you on behalf of the Jewish people, we're sending you out to finish the conquest for us, to finish settling the land. So that when, um, after Yeshua divides up the land between the seven tribes who didn't help finish, who didn't finish the conquest in the first wave, um, in the first 17 chapters of Yeshua. So when they finish their conquest, as delineated to them in chapters 18 and 19, that way it will be considered as though they're um, shlichim, they're doing it on behalf of the Jewish people. Now, then he says the lands that David co um, conquered outside of Canaan um, which they has a have a special status. And he says as follows, um, there's sort of a, a special status. We'll talk about that. That's a little complicated. We'll get written out later on. What's he saying? The lands that David conquered outside of Canaan. Now we have to see what Eretz Canaan means in a minute. They have a special status, but they're not like Eretz Canaan. They're not like Eretz Yisrael Lechol Davar. Lochu Chutzlar Lechol Davar Kagon Babel Mitzrayim. This phrase is important for me. What's he saying? There's lands like Babel and Mitzrayim, Mesopotamia and Egypt can never be part of Eretz Yisrael. That's what I want to build on. The way I understand here the Rambam, there's certain land that can be considered Israel if you conquer it. But certain lands are beyond the borders. What are they? Mesopotamia and Egypt. Let's go back to our map. Here's what I want to explain. When God tells Avram Avinu, I'm giving you and your children the land from the Harmit Sam to Nahar Prat. My claim is it's not including them, but rather up into them. And when he says Nahar Mitzam and Nahar Prat, we're assuming, like we know from when you study ancient history, the, the Nile River was never a border. It's the center of Egypt. The great centers of civilization are Mesopotamia and Egypt. Why? Because of the mighty rivers. The rivers are never borders. They're the center of a civilization. And therefore, and same thing with the, the, the uh, Euphrates River. It could be the Babylonians here, it could be the Assyrians, it could be beforehand Aram. Uh, later it's gonna be the Persians taking over from this area. But this area is always ruled by some power, but the river itself, the Euphrates River is always the center of the country and not its border. And therefore when God tells Avram, you know, your land is gonna be between the Nile and the Euphrates, the way I understand it, it means it's between Mesopotamia and Egypt, somewhere in between. How far in between? Well, here's what we begin with. We begin with Eretz Canaan. Eretz Canaan is from Dan to Beersheba. And basically, we begin with this kernel. We start here. First, we have to conquer from, again, from the Negev, from Beersheba, the Negev, all the way to Dan, to the Galilee, up between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. Once we conquer that, then we can expand our borders to the south, we can take the Negev, we can go take Transjordan, we can go into Syria, etc. We can go on, we can basically expand out. Let me give a couple, make a couple arrows here. Let's, once I have this land, I can go this direction, I can go that direction, I can go here, I can go to the south. We don't have to, but we can. But never more than Egypt or Mesopotamia. Because we're chosen to be God's model nation. And remember the big, the big highway that connects between Egypt and Mesopotamia goes along our coast, it's called the Via Maris. So therefore, people will be traveling through our land. We can have an effect on those nations, but our goal is not to take over the entire Middle East. Our goal is to be a land, a strong country at the center of the Middle East, but the great center of civilization, Egypt and Mesopotamia, are not part of our country. And Nahar Mitzam and Arpad don't mean the rivers themselves, they mean the countries centered on those rivers. And then now we're gonna show you in the Rambam how he explains this. So let's take a look now. Let's there are the drawings and return to our source sheet. I'm not that one, go back to the mouse, here we go. This is what he says. Um, here. I in ours, here we go. Um, okay, now, okay, we have Pasuk, I mean, Halakha Dalad. We have my Yodumi Malat Eretz Yisrael. How come Syria is not like Israel? Eretz Yisrael? Because David conquered it before he conquered, before he was sovereign over Eretz Canaan. Okay, this is what he says now. Had Yeshua first conquered, or before, before the, between Yeshua and David, had David actually been able to conquer and be sovereign 
on all the borders of Eretz Canaan first, and then he took Syria, and then he, then it would have the halachic status of Eretz Israel. But Syria has a special status because it was taken before he took all of Eretz Canaan. Now, here comes the topic now that relates to the book of Nehemiah. What the Rambam is basically saying that to define the land of Israel to be obligated in Trumot Masroth, I need to be sovereign. And first, Yeshua is commanded first to possess and conquer the land of the seven nations from Dan to Beersheba, basically the land of Canaan. And afterwards, once he's done that, we have the option, if we want, to expand our borders to Transjordan, like, like what the two and a half tribes do. We can take over the Negev, we can go down to Eilat. We don't have to, but we can. We have that option, but never more than, never more than um, the countries. Like we can, now, we're not supposed to take over Mesopotamia or Egypt, but up into the borders of who's ever running Mesopotamia and Egypt. Now, this is what he says now. The land that the first generation conquered from the time of Yeshua when we came out of Egypt was sanctified with the first Kedusha. Because we went into exile, but the Kedusha goes away. Why? Because it was based on sovereignty. Basically, the original holiness of the land of Israel, as far as again, as far as our halachic obligation of Trumot Masrot, is only based on military conquest. When we're exiled and the Babylonians take over, we're no longer sovereign, and therefore there's no longer any obligation to take tithes, to take Trumot Masrot. When we come back and buy Cheni, what happened? We have a new situation. We're living in our land, but we're not sovereign. And therefore, the Trumot Masrot, and we'll see in Bikurim in a minute, but the, the laws that reply to land to Eretz Yisrael, basically, we return to, I guess, to Eretz Canaan, but we don't return to Eretz Yisrael because we're not sovereign. And therefore, the Rambam makes, in the end of the Perak, he makes this amazing statement. Hatrum vizmanazeh, meaning the time of the Rambam. Even the places where we were living, since we weren't sovereign, but we were living, even during the time of Ezra, but we're talking about it in our shir, based on what we saw in the book of Ezra, the question is the book of Ezra the Rambam's source or the Rambam's proof? But the Rambam is claiming that even in the time of Ezra, when he makes this agreement, this amana, this reaffirms the treaty to keep God's laws and to take Trumot Masrod, it only has the halachic status of the Rabbanon, but not the Oraita. Why? Show Torah, Ella Be'eretz Yisrael. Truma Dioraita. Truma that were her halakhic obligation to keep Truma to Masrod is only applies in Eretz Yisrael, which means land that is that we're sovereign in. And hence, Bisban Shi Ko Yisrael Sham. Therefore, the people of this have to be living there. What's his proof? Because the laws in Vaikra, they talk about at the end of the laws of Shemitah, says what happens? Kitabal Arts, when you come to the land, actually, I'm thinking it's I think also, we'll see in a minute, I think he's referring to Devarim. I'm not sure if this quote is correct there. I think it's referring to Devarim. Okay. We need everyone to come back and be sovereign. Not like when we came back, if that's the way it will be in, our, in the third Yerusha, hopefully in our days. But not like During time that only a portion of people came back and we weren't sovereign. Therefore, we didn't have a biblical obligation to keep Trumot Masrot. Okay. The same thing refers to Masrot. Okay. Trumot and Masrot are basically, if we go back to what we just saw in the book of Ezra, in light of this Rambam, I'm using the Rambam to explain our understanding. What did they do? They said they took upon themselves to keep. Remember, everyone made a shvua to keep all the misot of God, all of his laws, all the laws of the Oraita, and then not in their marriage, and keep Shabbat. And then they might, we took upon ourselves these extra mitzvot, we call the Rabbanon now, to bring um, extra money for the temple, extra wood, and to bring Bikurim, and to bring um, Masrot. That's exactly what the Rambam saying. Why did we have to take upon ourselves 
this mitzvah because we weren't chayv the Araita. Um, now, basically, um, in light of this, you understand exactly the first speech and how the first speech relates to what they're doing. What are we saying? We're about to make this agreement with God, with this reaffirming our covenant with God. We're going to take upon ourselves as an act of faith that we're going to treat the land of Israel as though we're sovereign, even though we're not sovereign. But that's why at the beginning of the speech, it goes back to Brit Ben of Tarin and saying, you know what? We know you promised us that we'd be sovereign one day, and we were, and we hope the Brit Ben of Tarim is eternal. And one day we will return to the land to be sovereign again. But in the meantime, even though we're not sovereign, we're going to treat the land of Israel as though we're sovereign. And that would be sort of a statement of recognizing um, that we very much want to be sovereign in our land. But in his speech, he's saying, you were right. You know, you've kept your side of the covenant. The reason why we're not sovereign is because we didn't keep our side of the covenant. And that's why he goes through his whole speech, how bad we were. And he says, you know, it's, it's all because of our sins. And you're right. But on the other hand, we want to show like as a, as a sign of faith and dedication to you, we're going to take upon ourselves an obligation that we're really not obligated. Now, the reason I'm making such a big deal about it is because in the first part of our course, I was trying to explain why was it that so many people didn't return? And how so many people questioned, is this really Rashid Smechat Golotain? Is this really beginning of our redemption? So we talked about because it's under foreign rule. Remember, it's under, only Korsh gave us the right. When you understand the idea of returning to the land of Israel, we need to be sovereign. Then if we're returning under a foreign power, it's understandable why people thought that's not considered redemption. Only if we're sovereign in the land, it's considered full redemption. And that might explain why people didn't return. What are they saying now? We're going to treat the land as though we're sovereign, even though we're not sovereign. And hopefully that will that sh show of faith might get God a reason, maybe to help us out and regain our sovereignty one day. Now, um, remember I told you in, in, um, in um, well, we did the Rambam. The first thing he talked about was Bikurim. If you go back to Sefer Devarim, I think that's what Rambam was referring to. How does the laws of the Bikurim begin? First, you have to possess it. Okay, let's see here, possess and, and settle it. I need military conquest in order to be obligated in Bikurim. And that's exactly what we saw in Nehemiah. Then, then you take from your first fruits. And the Rambam understands that clearly. That's why Bikurim are only, and, and Trumo as well, is, is only after conquest. Um, but once, but also has to be um, when the whole nation comes to land, and that's just an individual. Now, as far as these two borders of the land of Israel, so we saw in Brit Ben of Tarim, there's the idea of Yerusha from the very beginning, but now it's God says, I took you out of Or Kazdim to keep this land as Yerusha. And I've been asked, when, is, when and how is it going to happen? They text the whole process going down to Egypt, coming out of Egypt. And then that day, God made a Brit. I'm giving you this land from Nahar Mitzrayim to Nahar Prat, which I explained are the limits, basically between Egypt and Mesopotamia, but not including. But that includes in the land in between those two borders. Here it's 10 nations, and later it boils down to seven nations. That's in chapter 15 in Breshit. In chapter 17 in Sefer Breshit, God makes what's called Brit Milah. It's a different covenant, B'Shem Elohim, without going to the different names of God and different reasons for the two covenants. But in that covenant, God promises he'll be with him, and we have to behave and God will make a Brit, and it will change Abraham's name, and he'll make this Brit that he'll be our God and we'll be his people. And as a place in order to fulfill the Brit, God says, the land you're living in, I'm setting that aside as a vehicle through which you'll be able to fulfill your breed to be my people. That'll be an eternal inheritance. That's not Yerusha, that's always there. Therefore, the Kedusha there is Canaan, as far as the land that's set aside to become the land we're going to live in, is always there. He'll be our God, we'll be his people. There's something special about the land of Israel that Rabbi Yudah Levi talks about in Kuzari, the school of the land. That's always there, whether, we're, whether we con conquer it or not. But our obligation to take tithes that's only when we're sovereign. And it could be because who do you pay taxes to? You pay taxes to the sovereign power. If you're not sovereign, you pay taxes. If you're not sovereign, you pay taxes to a foreign power. 
if we're sovereign, so we collect taxes, but to show God that we appreciate that he gave us the ability to be sovereign, so symbolically, we give our tithes to, to God. That's why Truma to God, and then God gives it to the priests. It's, we bring up Bikurim to God. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of showing God, even though we're sovereign, we're thanking God for that sovereignty, and it's thanks to God we're sovereign in order to become his people. So you could understand that the laws of Trumot and Masrot are there as a way of showing God that we appreciate that he gave us sovereignty in our land, again, once we do have sovereignty. So that's the main... Um, now, the exact borders of Eretz Canaan, so we quickly, Parsha Masay, if you want to be uh, precise, based on Brit Milah, God tells Moshe Rabbeinu in, in the end of Sefer Bamibar in chapter 34, Sabbat ben Israel, this is in the 40th year, they're about to go into land. el Eretz Canaan, when you come to the land of Canaan, remember not Eretz Yisrael, but Eretz Canaan, the land between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, and from Dante Beersheba. What are the borders of Eretz Canaan? Well, that's geographic borders. So the geographic borders we need to conquer. But once we conquer it, it has the halachic status of Eretz Yisrael. What are they? So it starts in the south from the from um, Midbar Tzin, we'll see in a minute, basically from the bottom edge of, of the Dead Sea. And it goes all the way through the Negev, you know, basically south of Be'er Sheva, to Madak Rabim, and it ends up in Badi El Arish, called Nacha Mitzrayim. Um, and then from Nacha Mitzrayim, I'm sorry. Um, Nacha Mitzrayim is not Nahar, Nacha Mitzrayim is Badi El Arish. Nachal is not a river. Nachal is a waterbed of a valley. It doesn't have water all year long. Um, so Nacham Mitzrayim, almost most people understand it, probably Vadi El Arish or somewhere between Azda and El Arish. There's a, there's a valley which is um, sort of defines the, the, south, the southwestern border of Israel. But from there, we go along the coast, we'll go Yam, the coast all the way up north to Horahar. And then Horahar is somewhere up in Lebanon, probably you know, Horahar, somewhere between Lebanon and the Hermon. And from there we go down from the Lohamat that's low north of Matula. And then it's not Hamat, but Lavo Hamat. Lavo Hamat is uh, probably a little bit north of Matula, but it's called, called Marjayun today, or Nahay or Ayun. If you know that in Lebanon more, Marjayun is a city in Lebanon, but it's probably what Lavo Hamat is referring to. And then the book goes down, um, basically um, goes down the Jordan River. And it goes down to Yam Kinneret, and then it's your raid from Dan. Yarden, it goes down from Dan. And that's, that's basically the borders of Eretz Canaan. So if I go back to my map over here, Eretz Canaan is basically from here to here to here and back down to here. Oh, here we go. That's it. That's, uh, wait, that didn't match up right. But that's the borders of Canaan. Let's close the drawings. Okay. Let me put the spotlight again. Canaan again is from the bottom of the Dead Sea to Vadi El Arish, Nacham Mitzrayim, to Horahar by Lebanon, and then down the Jordan River. Okay, I'm going to take, oh, here we go. That's what we did before. Now, I'm going to take questions quickly and let me check the chat. Oh, there's lots of chats. Um, share screen, not share screen chat. Okay. First, I'll go through the chats, then I'll take questions. Chat one is um but let me get wait a second i go back a little bit um but yeah ruth um oh wait we got a lot of them here hold up um okay about learning ezra nechemi in school we'll talk about that next week okay um okay bi that biblical intermarriage that's a halakhic topic for a rabbi to talk about um right okay that that's Again, I'm not going to go into the topic of halacha lamaisa, but for sure you shouldn't marry a non-Jew. Brit um, was made with Avram Avinu. Oh, and um, even though Brit was made with Avram Avinu, so some people say that some of the land went to Ishmael. That's one answer. But then later he says, Ki and what happened? How do we go from 10 nations to seven nations? A topic not for now, but maybe I'll talk about it next week a little bit. What question, what part of the phrase is referred to Brit Ben of Tarim? Ah, it just says the river. It doesn't say what part of the river. It doesn't say a certain point in the river. It says the Euphrates. I'm just claiming that the Euphrates means, basically the Euphrates means who's ever living in Mesopotamia. In 86, 89, Rishon Sion, um, 
Uh, any place would you step. Okay. So what does it mean by holiness? So uh, let me redefine my title of this year. As land of Israel, the holy land is always a holy land. But there's two, there's holiness, which is intrinsic holiness, because it's a land that God set aside for us to live in. And it's always important because of that. But the halachic status of being obligated to give trumot masrot, but we, what the Rambam calls Eretz Yisrael, that's dependent on sovereignty. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip all the intermarriage questions for now. Um, ah, Edom, Moab, and Amon, we weren't allowed to take. But later on, if you know your Sefer Dvarim, part of um, Amon we were able to take because someone else took it from them and then we took it from them. That was all Sichon. Sichon took over from Amon and Moab a little bit and then we took over from Sichon. Um, okay, what is the Rambam doing? He's writing after the possibility of conquest by the Israelis, basically, especially being inductive. Uh, that's a good question. What led the Rambam to his, um, it was, would the Rambam have reached, if I understand iPad's question, would the Rambam have reached that conclusion even without the book of Nehemiah and Nehemiah is his proof or is Nehemiah the source of the Rambam? Now, the, the other Rishonim talk about this issue. Some people say that the Rabbanan is only, some people totally disagree with the Rambam. Pretty sure the, the, it's gotta be the Rivet. It's, it's gonna disagree. The Mabin brings them all down also on the side. But some people say that Rabbanan are the Deoraita are the Sheva meaning, and they took upon themselves to take fruits even at the Sheva meaning. But that you can look in, in halachic literature and then you say check in the Rivet. But I, I think the Rambam's definition is built on the word Yerusha, and it's clear the Rambam's making a distinction between Eretz Canaan and Eretz Israel. That would, and, that, and that distinction that the Rambam is making. You see when you see the difference between Brit Ben of Term and Brit Milah. What I try to point out is when you study Chumash and Sefer Brashid, it's quite clear that the definition of, of the land that God promises Avram is different in Brit Milah compared to Brit Ben of Tarim. Now, Brit Ben of Tarim, God's name Yudke Vavke, sort of the God of history, or the God who gets involved in historical events, like going down to Egypt, getting out of Egypt, redemption in a miraculous way. So when we're talking about nations and Am Yisrael being a nation among nations, to have an effect on nations, but God's interaction with his people in relation to our national history, that'll be in the framework of Ben of Tarim. And therefore it makes sense that the borders have to do with our, um, our national existence and, and sovereignty, which makes you a nation. Brit Mila is more about a personal connection to God, a more um, what we call your classic word of holy, uh, closest to God. And therefore I don't need sovereignty in order to be um, have a connection to God in the land of Canaan. Like Avram is in Canaan, and he's close to God, even though Avram's not sovereign. Okay, and Kitavo is also in that. Kitavo is also in, um, in, in um, by the laws of Shemitah in, um, in Yovel. I think that's a big machoket when it comes to Yovel. You know, it was Yovel Nohe, you know, what happens when there's no Beit HaMikdash and we do sovereignty, we have Shemitah, but we don't have Yovel. That's a big also halachic argument. Okay, because the Chemin, the people obligated them to do Truma and Maser. Um, Oh, sorry, that's next week's shares. What do we have in today? So that's exactly what we're going to lead into next week. What's the halachic status of the land of Israel today? If I follow the Rambam, um, so the question is, is the state of Israel, if a bunch of Zionists from the Ukraine, you know, make a band of people and come and take over the land of Israel, is that considered the Jewish people? You know, what, what, what defines the Jewish people? Is the state of Israel the Jewish people? That's question number one. And what's considered... Rov Yisrael, what's considered, um, you know, a melech mitat Rov Yisrael. Who defines the Jewish people nowadays? And also we need a majority. Who defines who's Jewish considered a majority? Everyone who's um, signed up to a Jewish center somewhere. Those, if we have to have the majority of the Jewish people living in Israel, who defines that? The Pew Report? You know, that's a big question. What defines the Jewish people? We'll talk about all this next week. But I know that a lot of people are worried that if uh, too many Jews make Aliyah, and we become the and, and Rov of Am Yisrael is living in the land of Israel, and we have conquest. Then all the mitzvot become the Araita now, which would make things much more complicated halachically. So they're to do it to they stay in Chutzlar to make sure we don't have that problem, because so that's the uh, that's the reason why most people don't make Aliyah to save us from those problems. So that'll be our topic next week. Um, okay, so he says Kedusha Shnia is referring exactly. So it's these questions right on the mark. When the Rambam says Kedusha Shnia is forever because it's wherever it's, but it's Rabbanan forever. 
Meaning, as we said, wherever Jews are living, even if we're not sovereign, we treat it as though we're sovereign. But it'll become the right once we become sovereign. And that's what's key. That's what's so neat about the Rambam. And that's what makes our situation so important. Rav Gordon writes tons about this, about what, what's, I, I call this is kibush dayan shmei kibush. That's, if, if, when we in the Six Day War took over the whole West Bank and we became sovereign in the whole land of Israel, is that considered Am Yisrael conquered the land of Israel? That's, that's a, an amazing question that tons of rabbis have dealt with. We'll, we'll deal with that next week. I would consider it. So the Hermon would be outside the borders of Eretz Canaan. Excuse me, but uh, isn't but, that what, what Rav Nisan said? I wrote in in the comments. Uh, what did Rav Nisan say? It had say? to do with... I wrote it in the comment. He oh, said yeah, yeah, but that, anywhere, um, a Jew, anywhere a Jew walks is the land of Israel? Oh, here. In, in, in Batir. Yeah, it and has the holiness. I mean, after, after, he said this in, it was around 19... Let him finish the chance. Okay, here I see what we say. Is there any place North where Jews? Yeah. So I was talking about I was talking about Bati. I was talking about he's talking about if I understood him right, he's not talking about the of the obligation of Trumata Masro. He's talking about what's the land of Israel. I don't think he was giving how lucky he was giving. I think the Rav Nisim, talking to Zionist youth was giving a pep talk more than more than making a halakhi decision. I don't think I don't think when he was meeting Zionist youth, they were worrying about the Rambam and halakhi definitions. I think he was trying to inspire them to come and live in Israel or visit Israel. So wherever you, wherever you come, that's the land of Israel. I think uh, I, now he's referring to inward Jew step. That's Koma Koma Shirti That's from Sefer Yeshua, which is about Kibush. So he's taking a plastic probably out of its context in Sefer Yeshua. What's God tell Yeshua? Anywhere you go, I'll be there to help you. But that's when Yeshua conquers the land. Um, if a, uh, you know, a college kid a Zionist college kid comes and walks, I'll get like happened in the news a couple of weeks ago in Israel. If some Jewish person uh, jumps over the border into Syria and walks on a teal in Syria, does that make it the land of Israel because she's Jewish and she walked on the land? I don't think that makes it halakhically Jewish. Okay, let me finish the chat. Um, so Kedush Hashim would be for all that. Hermon, um, that seems to be you know, on the other side of the Jordan. So that would be, it has to do with the two and a half tribes. There's a whole complicated thing about Chatzim Menashe, about um, is Chatzim Menashe outside of Eretz Canaan or not? That uh, Rabbi Yolbin has a whole class on that. We'll talk about that next week. Um, Nahar Prat appears to be an option. It can't happen. Ah, ah, about Nahar Prat, we have to see a Pasuk in Sefer Dvarim in the beginning. When, when God says, Bo Roshut Aretz Ad Hanar Gado Ad Nahar Prat, there's a cloud in halacha called Ad Vulad Bichla. I mean, does it mean up until the Euphrates? Again, I'm defining Euphrates meaning Mesopotamia. And the fact that we never find a Navi yelling at us, how come we didn't take over Mesopotamia? Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, at least in, in hindsight, we never find any Navi you know, telling the people, how come you haven't taken over half of Egypt and half of uh, Mesopotamia up to the now in the Euphrates? I think it makes a lot more sense that it's referring to the, the country that's there as opposed to the, the river itself. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, actually, I actually want to hide myself. I don't know how to do it here. I'm trying to figure out how to do it. Okay. So in, um, I was before, and now, what's that? One second. Let me get a, uh, do a quick mute. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Tammy's asking, does that work today? Oh. So Israel is definitely sovereign, but that's our topic tomorrow. Next week is what, what considers. Wait a second. What, what makes what makes Israel um, is the state of Israel today considered sovereignty of the Jewish people to be high to Masrod? Almost all post game nowadays consider it Rabbanan, um, but questions come up. But it's discussed whether whether if, if the majority of Israel, if the majority of Jews move to Israel, whether it will become the the Araita. Again, that'll be our topic next week. Um, your idea of now to phrase being a center of country doesn't seem to apply to the Jordan River. Ah, no, the land that we're living in is in between the now and the Euphrates. So being in center, it's not the center. No. The land of Canaan, I'll try to explain this again. The land that God promised Avram Avinu that we have to take first, the kernel, is the land of Canaan. That's from the Euphrates to the, I'm sorry, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, from, from Dan to Beersheba. That was the middle of the map. 
After that, I'll, I'll try to explain that again. I'll show my screen again. Where are we? Uh, here we are. Let's go back to this map. Okay. The land of, this is Eretz Canaan. Even a little bit less than that. That's the land of Canaan, this area over here. Once we take Eretz Canaan from the, from, the, from the Jordan to the Mediterranean and from down to Beersheba, then we can expand in all different directions. But we have to take that first. And again, and we have to, I mean, the Jewish people have to take it, not just, not just a single person. So again, once we take this area, we can go to the south, we can go, we can take the Hermon, like we mentioned over here. We can take Transjordan and we can go, but never more than whatever country is around the Euphrates or the Nile that we don't take. But Egypt, if you know world history, Egypt is both sides of the Nile and Egypt is centered around the Nile River. It doesn't make sense. We're supposed to take up into the borders of the of the uh, the Nile River. The only river that's a border is that is the Jordan because the Jordan is not a river; it's a creek. You know, it's it's way below sea level, and it's a result of uh, you know, for geological reasons, it's it's not a river that you can use for farming your land unless until they made you know electric pumps that can pump the water up like we did. But the Jordan River is a natural border, whereas the Nile River is not a natural border. Of course, the, the, now the Euphrates and the, in the every major city on the globe has a major river at the center, like the, the Thames River in London, the Seine River in France, the Rhine in Germany. Every, every major civilization, every major country, it centers around a river. So a river, a major river, like the Euphrates now being an actual border doesn't make sense. On the other hand, because we're chosen to be God's model nation. It makes sense that God put our nation in a, in a position, from a marketing point of view, that we can have an effect on international um, ideas. So if centers of civilization already existed in Mesopotamia and Egypt, it's our goal to be a nation that can have an influence on them by being God's model nation. So it makes sense why God put us in between them, but not to conquer it. I think we're way over time. Yeah, let me finish up real fast. Let me finish the chat real fast. Um, I didn't realize how late it was. Uh, where are we stop the share and back to the chat um the, um you afraid of your country how about you said okay we'll talk about that next week okay okay once there is a majority okay no head to make is something else that's uh but you're right head to make is a big problem whether this relates to shmita is a big problem if, if you notice shmita was included in the deraita part so the rambam deals with it later on what happens with shmita shmita might have a different view if you know, um, next week you have to deal with that. But Shemitah might relate more to Brit Milad than Brit Ben Abtarim. But Shemitah has to do with Kushat Aretz, the intrinsic Kushat. If you, if you follow the, the idea of the number seven, um, and the idea of Brit Milad, seven plus one being eight, and Shem Elohim in creation. Like, whenever you have Shem Elohim, it's always the number seven. And the laws of Shemitah relate to number seven, which relates back to creation and Shem Elohim. So it makes sense that Shemitah is not going to be related to Brit Ben of Tan, but rather to Brit Milah. Whereas um, paying taxes and Shema giving tithing makes sense would be, makes sense that would be um, Brit Ben of Tanrim and Shemit Kifafke. And Yova also that we have to see that, which one it relates to. Um, okay, and okay, good. Okay, I think we're way over time, right, Rabbi Jay? It's okay. Question period. It's okay. So it's not a question. As okay. long as you're willing to stay. By the way, it's not clear. Yeah, I'll say if anyone has other technical questions, but um, yeah, but the if, the halacha implications of Israel today is that's next week's share. No, it's next week's share. We're going to finish up and see how this relates to Israel today, and um, halachically, also and you know, philosophically, I guess uh, about what's considered the people of Israel, what's considered the land of Israel, what's considered holy what Kedusha means, et cetera. But I just wanted to explain, the main goal today was to use what Nehemi is doing to support everything we talked about of why the people don't think this is Geula because we're not sovereign and how the issue of not being sovereign, but in your land, it was this dialectic, you're in the land of Israel, but not sovereign land of Israel was, was basically the underlying problem from the time of the Cyrus Declaration. And what does it mean to be God's people and in your land, but not sovereign in your land. And how do you deal with that? And which is very similar to Israel, at least up until the Six Day War.
All right, Rabbi Eshkoch, if, if I may, I'll just add a little comment, that whole intermarriage thing that, you know, back and forth. It okay, really yeah, doesn't I didn't, matter. I told you, I told, that's his topic yeah, for Rabbi. It's really, I, 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 no, no, I, I, I did look it up in the tour. It's, of course, we intermarried one of the, you know, the end of the line for you. Like 95% of people who have married their grandchildren aren't Jewish. Obviously, intermarriage is one of the worst things you can do, and that's why you used to sit shiva, et cetera, et cetera. However, um, the tour does say, and disagreeing with the Rambam, the tour does say it's only an Isur de Rabbanan, if not for the Zainab. Mm -hmm. I mean, he holds intermarriage is only the Rabbanan, doesn't mean it's allowed. But my point is, it's irrelevant, um, especially coming up to Pesach. What the technical prohibition, that's the famous, you know, Mesha Chachma that we were redeemed in Egypt because we didn't change our clothes, or language, whatever those odd things are, not so important. I mean, Rav Moshe, like, there's no mitzvah in the tour like that. And the Mesha Chachma is this, you know, beautiful piece that mitzvot take on historical importance, that you can't just look at the technical aspect in a certain time period, yeah. but you're wearing a Magain David is really, really important. So it would appear to me that at the time of Kivush Aretz, obviously marrying one of the Zion Amimim would be very, very scary and very dangerous. They would lead you astray. But some person from some other non country, who just, they would assimilate into the common, like, like, you know, culture. In other words, it didn't, the Torah wasn't afraid that uh, Ammonite or whatever, and they can't marry them either, but uh, whatever, somebody would, they would assimilate into the, the people. My, my point just being whether it's the Rabbanon or the right, that doesn't really matter from so how- Maybe that's why Mordecai had a heter for Esther. Yeah, and, uh, okay, okay. And the true matter by, by Heter Shmita, the, the Heter Mechira, we sell our chametz, which is in the Sudoraita. It's not clear. It's true they use the fact that Shmita is the Rabbanan as a reason to be more lenient than the Heter Mechira. But even if it's Doraita, it doesn't mean we can't use it. Otherwise, we couldn't sell our, our chametz. And there are people like that. There are people who are machmer not to sell bread because it's in Sudoraita and they don't want to sell it. But we, it's the, as you say, it's all very complicated. And uh, that's for the halachic, you know, plus came to the these, side. I thought the easiest solution is not to live in Israel. Then we don't have any problems. Okay, that's why you're living there. And uh, I'm not going to say that's why I'm living here, because that's not true. I'm living here. I know, I know. <laughs> not everybody knows your sense of humor, you know, when you're, because you, you sometimes say it, but sometimes you don't say it. That you're joking, but the uh, people who hear you, hopefully by now after 20 shuring, people know your sense of humor. And when you're uh, you're kidding, but uh, anyways, uh, but, uh, you know it's like Rev Rimon. I remember when Rev Rimon was last round, he talked on the on Shemitah, and he said, you know, people don't want to eat. It's very day. You know, oh my God, the kedusha tree says it's a mitzvah according to the Ramban. It's a mitzvah to write that to eat Shemitah products. We should be excited. Yeah, so then we should be excited that we can. <laughs> Correct, correct. But many people halachically, they would prefer to remove the Kedusha Haaretz so as to avoid the issues involved in what do you do with the Peirach feet. We should be excited that 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 Yovel is going to turn into a mitzvah the right. Whether it's the Pew report or how we're going to count Jews, that is uh, not so simple. But uh, anyways, all right. Anybody my, my claim is the, the people who define Jew, what defines who's a Jew or what defines the Jewish people are the non-Jews. Okay, that, that's uh, Rav Soloveitchik said that. Whoever Yamach, Hitler, Yamach Shuram would have killed, that's uh, we're all part of the same Jewish nation. If Hitler defined you as Jewish, they, there does something to that. There is, you know, the covenant of faith and the covenant of faith. You know, there's the halachic definition, but there are things beyond halacha. Yeah. Uh, Zeri Yisrael, we'll call it, you know, but, uh, it's another complex halachic issue. Anyways, okay, thank you very much. We'll see you next week, and please go out after that, but next week, the last of the